Hi guys! So I am here to review for you all of the books <laughs> that I read in July and I say that with a slight tone of trepidation because I read quite a lot in July and I'm really thinking that I may have to bring back the mid-month wrap-ups in August just to make it a little bit more manageable and also because wrap-ups are actually my favourite videos both to film and watch because I really love just like hearing about lots of different books in one place and someone's thoughts on them and I also just really like being able to tell you my thoughts on everything I've read because you know you sort of bottle it up after you read the book and uh, wait for this point in the month so you can tell everybody your thoughts and hopefully have conversations about them. But if I've obviously read quite a few books it gives me a little bit less space to talk about them all because I run out of it, you know, uh, momentum as the video goes on. So I'm going to try my best to review all of these books to the fullest that I can and there were some excellent like five star books in there and hopefully in August I will do a mid-month wrap up just to break things up a little bit. Yes, yeah, so I think I have 11 books to talk to you about in total and I'll just sort of work my way through what I read at the beginning of the month up until the end of the month. And the first book I actually finished in the month of July was Ring Shout by P. Jelly Clark. So this is a sort of supernatural, surrealist, alternative history novella <laughs> published by Tor Books. Now Tor Books publishes a whole host of different novellas in the sort of speculative genres of fantasy and science fiction and horror and I have had great success just randomly picking up books from their novella series in the past. I've discovered some of my favourite authors including P. Jelly Clark who I've read two books by in the past, uh, one of which was part of that series and I absolutely loved. So I've been sort of keen to continue reading whatever he brings out. And this is his most recent book. I got this for review off of NetGalley and I loved it. I think I've mentioned in quite a few videos of late that I've been really feeling the kind of creepy books, I've been really feeling the horror. And this is erring on the side of horror, but also alternative history. So we are in the early 1900s, around the time of the release of Birth of the Nation, which was a film adapted from a book, which painted the Ku Klux Klan as these like white knight heroes that saved women from black men. It was very racist, it was racist propaganda that had the sort of cinemas flooded, like so many people went out to see this film. It was a real film, look it up, don't necessarily watch it, but read about it. It's, it's sort of really kind of disturbing and it's during the sort of Jim Crow era of American history. But in P. Shelley Clark's supernatural version of events, the Ku Klux Klan actually allow monsters from another world to possess them. So they originally, the founders of their movement, um, sort of conducted a ritual to these like creatures, let them into this world and let them into their bodies. And there are both like ordinary humans that are part of the Ku Klux Klan, but there are also members who are being possessed by these sort of demonic like creatures from another world that are taking advantage of the hatred that the members of the Ku Klux Klan and white supremacists feel and the sort of segregation that they enforce and using that as a as a bridge into this world and we follow in particular one black woman who um, has taken it upon herself to hunt down these Ku Kluxes which is what they call the monsters that possess the members of the clan. And this is such a clever supernatural alternative history because it in no way erases the horrendous actions of the Ku Klux Klan. It is very much showing that they allowed the monsters in and it's just creating this very like detailed, gruesome metaphor for what happened and um, still exists in today's society. So although this is a history historical novel, it's still very relevant to today and I thought it was so clever, so like, evocative, um, atmospheric, the images were very vivid, it could be quite gruesome in parts and very very creepy. So I really enjoyed it, it's exactly what I was looking for and I really recommend P. Jelly Clark's writing in general so this was just like another win for him. We then actually have a reread and that is Pure Dead Magic by Debbie Glory. So if you can't tell this is my sort of beat up childhood copy of this book. It's a middle grade book that I myself read when it first came out. I adored this series as a child. It first came out in 2001 but this edition came out in 2002 so I imagine that that will be when I read it and I would have been 10. So I loved these books when I was that age and I have the further one, two, three, four, five, so I've got six in total on my bookcases and I was talking about this with my friend Jill because I consider this sort of like a bit of like 
a quintessential book of my generation's childhood in Scotland because Debbie Glory is a Scottish author and the book is set in Scotland and a lot of my friends at school read it at the same time as me. But Joe went to a different school and apparently didn't have the same wave of popularity there so it was super interesting because I was surprised she hadn't read it and she said she would like to read it as an adult so I buddy read it with her but obviously for me it was a reread and for her it was a first time read. So it was interesting talking about it because I still really loved this book as an adult. It's really, really humorous. That is like <laughs> the genre I put it into, fantasy humour. And I love that. But it's definitely one of those middle grade books is very random and wacky and you really just have to go with the flow and accept what's happening. Like you have to accept that if a uh, rat were to climb into the modem of your computer and you were to hit send on an email, the email would send the rat through the uh, like sort of internet to the recipient. It, it's kind of like weird technological magic that isn't really explained, it doesn't really need to make sense, it's more just meant to be funny. And I like that, especially as a child. This kind of like wacky fantasy humour was what I lived for as a child. But I can appreciate what Jill said, which was that as an adult, she didn't really feel she appreciated as much as she would have if she'd read it for the first time as, as a child, which I can understand. Because I think there is middle grade that still very much appeals to adults and it has a lot of like plot to sink your teeth into and a lot of character development and intrigue. And there's books I've read for the first time that are aimed at children as an adult that I've still loved. But other books which are aimed at children and that is their primary demographic so that is who they should be appealing to maybe don't work as well for an adult audience of first time readers. So although I loved rereading this and returning to the silliness, I can totally appreciate what Jill said that maybe it's not the kind of middle grade I would recommend to adults who haven't read it before, but I would recommend it to children. So if you know any children in your life, love this series, love Debbie Glory's writing, love her sense of humour, and to be honest if you do just love books that are one big long joke then you might still really love this as an adult as well, and I would certainly debate continuing on with the series in a, in a reread. We follow a family who live in the Scottish Highlands, a mother, a father, a son, a daughter and a baby girl, so three children, as well as their new nanny and the assortment of different mythical magical beasts that live in their castle, including um, like a dragon and a yeti, and this is all set in modern day by the way, it's set in the early 2000s, like I mentioned, there are computers in this book. And the main crux of the story in book one is that the father has been kidnapped, but like I said, kind of more about the humour than it is about the storyline. It's not like you're really that curious about, oh my goodness, how is this all going to pan out? What are all the secrets that we need to uncover? It's more just like fun, wacky fun. Whilst I've got it to hand, I'll just mention this book next and it's I Married My Best Friend to Shut My Parents Up, which is a one-shot manga um, by Kodama Naoko. And what I mean by one-shot, sorry, is that it's sort of like a standalone. It's not in a series, it's just like a little one-off manga and I have been trying to get back into manga recently. I say trying, I am getting back into it, like I still enjoy it but I hadn't been reading it for a long 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 time and I wanted to sort of see what else was out there and that I might enjoy as an adult as opposed to what I really loved as a teenager and I thought this one sounded like so much fun because it is basically about um, a young woman who um, gets married to her friend who's also a woman. It's something like a civil partnership because this is set in Japan and according to the law wherever they live that's apparently what they can do. It's not really like a legal system I'm that familiar with but you know they have a sort of civil partnership between these two women because um, one of the women is constantly being pestered by her parents to get married so it's like ha I'm married now but to a woman. Her parents aren't particularly pleased about that but that doesn't really matter to her and it also means her friend has somewhere to live because she was looking for somewhere to stay. And of course living in close quarters they end up falling in love and their marriage becomes real. It's very short, quick. In fact, there's a little extra story in here so if you think about it, it's this long but one sort of chapter or so isn't part of the main storyline or the main characters. It's another little story about two women slash girls that fall in love. So they're like um, both queer stories, which is lovely, but you know, not a lot, a lot of um, sort of plot or intrigue. It's very like brief, but very cute. And I love the concept and I love that it was like a very, um, explicitly queer manga. I haven't read much like that particularly involving um, women falling in love with other women. I really can't think of another manga I read that shows um, queer female relationships. I've, I've read manga where like it's been hinted at that uh, girls or women have fancied other girls or women but not so much 
they've actually been couples in the books so I really really like that and I think I would read more by this um, writer and illustrator in the future. I'd also love more recommendations of like female female mangas if you have them because this was like I said really cute but also very brief so it would be nice to maybe read something that was part of a series I could kind of um, spend more time with but if you would like to see the illustrations this is what they look like inside. Um, just to give you a little bit of an idea. We then have another reread, which was also another book from my childhood, which was the fifth book in the Charlie Bone series by Jenny Nemo called Charlie Bone and the Hidden King. I actually had grand intentions of filming a rereading childhood favourites video vlog this month, but you know, for one reason or another, it didn't really happen. But I did actually finish two middle grade books from my childhood, and this is part of a series that I have been rereading over the past like year, year and a half. And book five is actually the last book that I ever read. So book five is not the last book. I think there's like six or seven or eight. Let me double check how many books are in the series. But I only ever read five as a child because I sort of grew into an age where I wasn't reading as much. So never finished them as they were coming out. And I've been doing this reread with the hopes of finally finishing the series. Yes, there are eight books. So I still have three left. And it's going to be really fun, I think, to finally get to sort of find out what happened because I always remembered the Charlie Bone series really fondly but never knew how they kind of worked out. So I'm really looking forward to that and I'm really looking forward to the next book which will be the first time I'm reading it ever. It won't be a reread. Um, however, in terms of The Hidden King, I didn't remember a ton of details from this book. I only remembered that there is this big plot revelation and um, this twist in the storyline that you kind of see coming but really takes place in book five that I'd been waiting for and it finally happened in book five so it was kind of nice to uh, relive that and have that confirmed for me but other than that the plot was a little bit hazy. I can't say I remembered the plot of book five all too well and I also can't say too much about it because obviously it would be spoilers but the series itself is about Charlie Bone who is a young boy who ends up going um, to a weekly boarding school so he goes home every weekend. He lives with his mum, his grandmothers on both sides of his family. His dad went missing when he was a child and his great uncle on his dad's side as well. And various different people in his family on his dad's side have magical powers and so do some of his fellow students. So he goes to this boarding school which is for gifted children. Now some of those children have gifts like just being good at music or acting or art whereas there are other children who have magical abilities and he is one of those children and they're known as the children of the Red Kings. So they're all descended from this same uh, magical king that lived hundreds and hundreds of years ago and Charlie can um, hear the thoughts of people in photographs so he can know what they were thinking about when that photograph was taken and listen to them and obviously it's about the mystery of his father and about the other magical abilities and lots of other things that might be going on. Not everyone in his family is on the sort of good side of the storyline. It's definitely one of those middle grade series where the parents are a little bit ineffectual or the adults just seem to let the children do whatever. Like I love Charlie's uncle. He's such a fun character. I really like his inclusion but he's also so happy for Charlie just to like, yeah Charlie sure go off and do this really dangerous thing. I support you in your decisions which is slightly mad. But I still think it's a really fun series and it's one that I would actually recommend to adults. We then have a book that I read for the first time this month and gave 5 out of 5 stars and I'm not the only person to do that because everybody loves this book. Now, not everybody loves any book but a lot of people love this book and it is The Long Way to a Small Angry Planet by Becky Chambers which is a sci-fi novel that my friend Tasman chose for me when we swapped book hauls and it's a book that I have seen going around booktube for years now and people raving about but never really just like got around to myself partly because the hype kind of scared me off but since Tasman sent it to me I thought hey do you know what I'm gonna give this a shot and oh my goodness didn't live up to the hype. I love this book so much and I'm so excited to continue on with this series. If you like Firefly and haven't read this book, you have to read it. It gave me such Firefly vibes in all the best ways and I love Firefly. So I cannot recommend this book more highly if you're a fan of Firefly but just in general I think there's a lot going for this book because it's not just for fans of like hardcore sci-fi. I'm getting more into sci-fi of late but it's not a genre that I've ever spent as much time with as fantasy so I am sometimes a little bit more um, cautious of it and what I'm getting myself in for. But this book is about the characters. It does not matter that it's set in space. I love the detail of the space world but it's a book about characters and 
a group of friends and companions and I loved all of those characters, particularly Sizzix. Sizzix was my fave and they're just fantastic. I love following all these characters journeys. We get to see a little bit of all of their sort of lives and their emotions and they're a crew on this ship together and you spend time with each one of them and there's no like one main um, drama moment, there's like small moments of drama throughout for each character if that makes sense rather than it being a sort of plot that goes like this, it's like a plot that goes blah, 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 blah. that is of course the technical term for it and because of that I think some people find the plot maybe less like captivating because it's not so much of like a building up to one moment storyline it's more of like I said like a character story but I love that I love characters characters are what I care about the most when it comes to my literature I don't have to love every single character but I have to find them interesting and I did in this book and I also loved quite a few of them so it was just like a, a big winner for me and I also was so impressed by the level of detail in this book. Becky Chambers, who's written this book, set in the far-flung future in space with all these different alien races as well as humans who interact with one another and have complicated political systems and cultures and backgrounds and religions. How did she come up with it? Like, it feels so real, there's so much detail, it's incredible and just like completely blew me away. Again, Sizzix was my absolute fave. I also loved that there was uh, like queer rep throughout this book and it was just perfect. It was everything I could have wanted it to be and can't wait to read the rest. We then have another little novella by an author I'm already a big fan of and that is The Order of the Pure Moon Reflected in Water by Zen Cho. So this is my third book by Zen Cho and I love her writing. She is a beautiful writer. There's just something so elegant and captivating about her prose. I I always enjoy reading her books and this was no different. It was another one that I got for review off of Night Galley and was so excited when I was approved for it because, like I said, already knew I loved Zencho and this one sounded brilliant. It is about a group of outlaws who are carrying with them some very valuable items that they are potentially planning on selling. And they end up being joined on their journey by a nun, or an ex-nun, I guess she is still a nun, um, but she is no longer at her temple, something has happened at her temple which ended up um, leading her to be working as a waitress in a cafe and they end up um, embroiled in a bit of like an argument with someone else in the cafe when he starts accusing her of being a witch and helping her but also causing her more trouble so she decides to tag along with them and I loved this group dynamic. There was also a plot twist that I can't give away but I had my suspicions about it at one point. Not right from the beginning but something that the character said made me think oh I wonder and it was right and I was so glad it was right and I can't tell you what it is because it'd be a spoiler but just just let, let me tell you that I love the characters which I've already said is one of my favourite things about novels and I loved the um, interactions and um, conversations and relationships that grew between the characters and I was so pleased that it all worked out exactly as I wanted it to and she and again this is now where more Zencho created a really beautiful world because it's a novella we don't get all of the details of this world we um, just follow the journey of this this group and hear snippets about this world through their experiences and their backgrounds um, because they have different relationships with um, different religious cults in this world and different political movements and there's been a war and there's people on different sides of that war and these outlaws are sort of in danger of being arrested but all in all I love the comp but all in all I love the complexity and I think it actually worked that you didn't necessarily know everything about this world it was more about like these characters experience of this world and you just accepted what you learned and it was just another example of Zencho being a fantastic writer cannot wait to read more by heart would love to read another book about these characters like if there was a sequel I would be so excited so maybe maybe one day I could sort of keep my fingers crossed for that we then have goth girl and the ghost of a mouse by Chris Riddell this is another middle grade book for me this book was fun and enjoyable and I would probably have rated it quite highly if I was a child but as an adult it's one that I think maybe lacked something for me. When I look back on being a child myself and spending more time in the bookshops what I remember is there were sort of like two sections of the bookshop for children that sort of like six to nine section and that sort of nine to twelve and for me I always assume middle grade is that sort of nine to twelve 
range which you maybe would have stuck Harry Potter in those Charlie Bone books that I mentioned earlier and that I still really enjoy reading from but then there's that slightly younger children's section which doesn't necessarily appeal to me as much as an adult but I feel like I should caveat that by saying doesn't need to like my personal feelings and how much I enjoy the children book kind of aren't that relevant because I'm really not a child <laughs> so I think what's more important is that a child would love it and that's what I think is true of this book. A child would love this book. I would have loved this book as a child. The illustrations are magnificent. Chris Riddell, we all know, is like one of the best illustrators out there. I love his drawings. They're so captivating, so humorous. They bring stories to life and I've only ever encountered them before illustrating other stories, not his own stories. And I thought the story was super cute. It's about um, our protagonist who lives in this big grand manor house um, with her father, Lord Goth, but he doesn't spend time with her because she reminds him too much of her mother and her mother passed away so she's quite lonely until she ends up making friends um, with some children of people they've hired in the house and, and solving a mystery. But as an adult I do have to say the plot didn't really have me hooked. I thought it was cute but like I wasn't that invested and I kind of just zoomed through it and I do think these are lovely lovely books. I don't know if I'll continue on with the series because I think there's middle grade series that have a bit more meat to them for me personally but at the same time I know adults that do actually really love these books so it's maybe just me um, and you just maybe need to be in the mood for something really light and quick and fast and maybe I wasn't but I didn't dislike it by any means. I just don't think it falls into the kind of middle grade I still enjoy as an adult if that makes sense so it's one that I imagine I'll probably forget about but it doesn't mean I love Chris Riddell's um, illustrations any less by any means. I bet you're wishing I did that mid-month wrap-up now aren't you because We've been here a while. <laughs> the next book I want to mention to you is another middle grade book, but this is one that I adored. I gave five stars and wasn't a reread from my childhood. So it's just a middle grade series I adore as an adult. And can you guess what it is? Yes, it is the next book in the Incorrigible Children of Ashton Place series by Mary Rose Wood. This is book four, The Interrupted Tales. So I have been reading this series um, all, all year. I think I started at the beginning of 2020 and it is one of my favourite series, regardless of age demographic. I think it is truly spectacular and I love Mary Rose Wood's writing. I think it is humorous and clever and witty and intriguing and um, suspenseful and I don't know how it manages to be all of those things, but it does. This book in the series was actually particularly interesting because we really got some answers, we really were revealed quite a few big plot points and had confirmation of them, some things that had been revealed in the previous book and sort of had all that to sink our teeth into but actually just as many new mysteries are sort of introduced, it's like you get answers but those answers just make you have more questions you're like but how does that all add up how's that relevant what's going to happen next and you know what i don't know but i can't wait to find out and i have two more books to read in this series i have actually bought myself book five up until this point in time i've been reading them on script but i've just come to the conclusion that i love these books so much i'm definitely going to reread them and i want to start collecting them so i've bought myself book five will buy myself book six in a physical copy and then over time collect books one to four which i'd already read because I would like to reread them like I already know I want to reread them I love them I find them such comfort reads I really like to read them in the evening if I'm a little bit stressed because they're just so escapist but at the same time like I find myself getting like a little bit anxious for the characters when I don't know what's going to happen to them so it's not that there's no substance to them and I find it really hard to identify why I love them so much except that I just assume Mary's Wood is a brilliant writer and she just does brilliant things. If you haven't seen me rave about these books before, you might not know, but it's a bit about a young governess who um, leaves her school to take on her first job as a governess to three children who are the wards of a lord and lady. They're not their biological children. They were in fact discovered in the woods and raised by wolves and they are now being sort of raised um, to be more like civilised uh, human beings rather than wolves and our um, governess has to teach them Latin whilst also how to use a knife and fork because you know they've been living in the woods for a long time but there are so many mysteries like I think I've already iterated and I love it I love seeing how it all adds up and honestly don't know what to expect from the next two books and cannot wait we then have Written in Blood by Chris Carter so this is a uh, like thriller crime procedural novel it's set in the US and we follow 
one and we follow a few different perspectives but the main character is this detective and this detective um, comes to work one day and ends up with the diary of a serial killer on his desk and that sort of leads him on this um, hunt to discover who is the serial killer. Now the reason that they end up with this diary on their desk is because a pickpocket at the very beginning of the book named Angela pickpockets it from the serial killer. She has no idea what she's taking. She expects um, there to be a laptop or something useful in the bag, um, but it turns out to be this diary and she feels so horrified by the contents that she wants the police to know, so hands it in anonymously. But of course, they're also interested in who handed the diary in and whether she is going to be in further danger. Of course, I will say no more, but it is very dark, very gruesome, very fast paced and had my heart beating in my chest. Like, I was quite scared when reading this book. I was like really concerned. It did not feel like everything was going to be okay. There were real moments in the storyline where I felt myself going, oh my goodness, what's gonna happen? And one of the techniques that the author used quite a lot was to um, flip at the end of one chapter when some big revelation is made to a different character so we might then get a little bit of an insight into the serial killer's mind at that moment and that would mean you'd have to wait longer to see what was going to happen next and that really worked for me. I think it made the experience of reading this book a lot like watching a very dramatic, gruesome thriller procedural on the television, like Criminal Minds. It really, really reminded me of Criminal Minds. So if you like that show, I would recommend this book. It is part of a series, but I've not read any other books in this series. And I find this in general with detective slash mystery fiction, that often there's not like a large overarching plot. So you can pick up books anywhere you want. And for me, it didn't feel in any way like I should have read the previous books to read this one because it didn't really feel that much like it was about the detective's life. There may be more details about the te detective's life if you'd read the other books, but it felt very much like it was about the mystery. So it didn't bother me that I hadn't read other, any other books in the series. That might be something that you're less keen to do, but that's the kind of reader I am. And I was quite content reading my like gory, dark thriller as it was. And really, I feel like I need to make it clear that this is very dark because if you are in any way squeamish and don't like to read about torture, then maybe it's not for you. But if you like Criminal Minds, I'm pretty sure you'd like it. <laughs> Two more books, however, and I won't talk about them for too long because I did discuss both of these in quite a lot of detail in my last video, which was my reading vlog for the Finishathon. And two of the books I finished during that uh, vlog fell into the uh, July month. So those were Moonrise by Sarah Crossin, first of all, and this was five star read. In fact, both these books were five star reads, but Moonrise was a eh, emotional. I cried when reading this and I'm not too surprised given the th topic and the themes and also the fact that I cried during Sarah Crossan's other book which was called One. Her writing is so emotional and conveys such like sadness in such lyrical ways and that's possibly also because she writes in verse so this is a YA novel but it is written in verse so like one long 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 poem and it is so rhythmic that you just read it so quickly. I don't mean to say that you rush through it, but it just flows and it's quite difficult to put down because of how it flows. The only reason I put it down and had to come back to it was just because it was quite a sad book. And at the time I wasn't in the frame of mind for sad. And then when I came back to it, I felt more able to cope. And it's about a young boy who's just turned 17, I believe, and moves to a new part of the USA where his brother is actually in prison. His brother is on death row and it is not long before his execution date and he wants to spend more time with his brother before he is executed. And it is very sad because it's about family and grief and sort of like just the unfortunate circumstances that these children and who are now adults have gone through. Um, but also specifically dealing with the concept of capital punishment and how basically impossible it is to make sure that it's a just system. I don't agree with capital punishment, um, but I think at the very bare minimum, it is obvious to see that it's very difficult to have a justice system rooted in capital punishment because it is almost impossible, it is impossible to be 100% certain of every sort of convict that ends up on death row. And then even if you are sure they committed the crime, is death the reasonable way to deal with that? That's another question. But what this book does touch on is whether or not he's guilty. 
um, and whether that really matters in terms of whether it's okay to, to do this because of also the massive, massive amount of harm it causes the family of the, the convict. I mean, what this boy goes through seeing his brother in this position, having his date of death sort of put in the diary, like some event that you can build up to is so harrowing. And it was really, really interesting to read a book from the perspective of someone, a family member of someone on death row. And I just thought it was beautifully, beautifully written. So, so emotional, interesting, incredible. Would highly recommend every single person go and read it. Like seriously, this is one of the books that if you're wondering what read after this video it should be because it was brilliant and I loved it so that's my thoughts on that one very sad though obviously like I mentioned and then we have Mexican Gothic by Silvia Moreno Garcia this is my first book by this author also five stars love this book this book is so good I really 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 liked it and I want to talk about it with more people so please leave a comment down below if you've read it as well because there's so many twists and turns and I'm like oh I need to talk about it I wish I had buddy read this with someone because it's a kind of book where I was constantly speculating and really wanted to speculate with other people but here we go, I've read it now and I still really enjoyed it. <laughs> it's about um, a young woman in 1950s Mexico whose cousin got married about a year ago and went to live with her husband and they haven't really heard much from her since until they get this really concerning letter, our main character and her father. And this letter suggests that perhaps there is either something ailing the cousin or something dangerous going on at this manor house where she finds herself living and our um, main character goes to visit our cousin and check in on her and see what's happening, sort of get more of a feel of her husband who they didn't know very well and of course it just gets darker and darker. This is very much in the vein of classic gothic horror. Um, it is playing on those tropes. This book reminds me so heavily of writers like Shirley Jackson and Daphne du Maurier, although I preferred this to Daphne du Maurier. So if you like those authors, then you might like this. If you also like something a little bit creepier, then you might like this. And I just loved it. I, I really like felt so invested in the storyline. I never felt like everything was going to work out okay, I wasn't sure who was going to be okay by the end, but I was so here for their journey and what was going to happen, I just thought it was brilliant, I thought it was so well written, so atmospheric, so intriguing, so well paced, like the, just the pacing was perfect and I think that's so important with a kind of mystery novel or a horror novel, it needs to keep you captivated and it needs to move at the right pace. I feel like I'm saying the word pace a lot, but it's true, even more so than some other genres, I feel, um, because you need to kind of maintain that momentum of investment and potentially fear and sort of worry for the characters, and it does this. And it 100% has quite like a feminist slant on horror, and I'm really looking for more like female horror writers, because I think in a lot of traditional horror that I've read, there is quite a lot of sexism, which is very unfortunate. There's also discussions of um, race and eugenics, so I think there's a lot tucked into this 300 page novel and I really hope the author writes more horror in the future because I would love to read it. But those are all the books I read in July! Who knows how long this video is? Have we been here for an hour together? I don't know, but I hope you haven't minded it. I hope you've enjoyed these reviews and I would love to hear from you if you've read any of these books or are just potentially now interested in reading any of them because of my reviews. I'd also love to hear any of your recommendations inspired by the books in this video. And until next time, happy reading. I'll see you all again soon. Bye everyone.